We're going to turn our attention now to distributed memory parallel computing. Um, the platform that we're going to use is something called the Message Passing Interface, or the MPI. And I want to give you some examples of how that works and an overview of the basic pieces and parts of MPI. So the Message Passing Interface, kind of a standard for message passing computation. Remember that on a distributed memory machine, we've got a bunch of different pairs of CPU and memory, and those are independent of one another, and the only way that we can move information from one pair of CPU and memory to another is by doing communication across a network. And so the message passing interface supports that kind of distributed computing. Uh, it's a cross-platform uh, implementation. It's been around for quite some while, and it runs on everything from your desktop machine to some of the largest supercomputers. It's also language agnostic, so there's support for it for C and C++, but also older languages like Fortran, which is still very, very widely used in a lot of supercomputing applications. There's a couple of different implementations of MPI. Uh, one's called MPI-CH. This is uh, an open source project, and it's the CH at the end is actually from the Chameleon system, which was kind of a wrapper or a, a layer beneath MPI that allows you to port it to different, different uh, machines. There's been various uh, versions of it that have come along, and you can see that there's a certain set of collaborators, both from industry and academia. Another implementation of, op of MPI is called OpenMPI. Um, again, it's an open source thing, and there's a lot of collaborators here, including some overlap with the uh, MPI CH. So let's look at some of the basic concepts that are used in MPI. One of these that we're going to appear all over the place is what's called a communication domain. Now, when we're thinking about writing code in MPI, we're thinking about individual processes that are running on different CPUs that are going to communicate with one another. And the various communication patterns that are supported by MPI are encapsulated and kind of abstracted out in what MPI calls a communicator. And there's a there's a class or a, a type defined for communicators called MPI COM. And there's also a predefined default communicator that basically says every CPU in the multi-computer is part of this, and that's MPI COM world. You can start to see some uh, some conventions here that MPI observes. Most of the functions and types are going to be prefixed with MPI. And then con uh, using the st standard C convention, we're going to see that constants are defined in all uppercase. Um, in our case, we're not going to really make a lot of use of different types of communicators. We're just going to assume that we have a communicator that allows us to communicate with any of the other processors on the multi-computer. Um, but if we were doing something more elaborate, we could partition them into different different groups and so forth. We're not going to monkey with that. But because this is just going to show up in a lot of the API calls, I wanted you to be aware of that. Here are four functions that we're going to use all the time in our MPI programs. The first of these is called MPI init, and this is basically just going to configure our program to run MPI, to initialize all the data structures and so forth, and to process, uh, in fact, to process some command line arguments, and we'll see how that works in a bit. So this is something we have to call before we call any other MPI functions in our program. Corresponding to the init, there's also a finalize, which is something that we want to call at the very end of our program before we exit back to the operating system or before we stop the process. This allows uh, MPI to turn turn off any communications channels that it's got open or anything like that, free memory, that kind of thing. We can also, when we start running our program uh, after MPI init, we can learn about the configuration of distributed processors in which we're running. So MPI COM size, these obviously have something to do with the MPI communicator. We can see that the COM size allows us to get the number of processes that are communicating inside of our communicator. And again, because we're going to use this global MPI COM world communicator, it's just going to be all of the processes that are running in the distributed computer. And then MPI COM rank tells us who we are. When we were talking about threaded programming, I advocated the idea of creating a kind of a thread ID that we ginned up as we started up individual threads. We don't have to do that with MPI. It's going to create its own index into the communicator that we're using, and it's the global one, so it's just going to be a global index for each of 
the uh, processes that are participating. Notice something about these uh, these API calls. They take a lots of pointers. Um, in particular, the the com size, for example, it takes as an argument a pointer to an integer. The way we're going to use that is we're going to define an integer that's going to store the size of the multi-computer, the number of processes that are part of the part of an, part of the runtime, and we're going to pass an address of that variable into MPI com size. And what MPI com size does then is sort of fills in that value for us to tell us how big a machine we're running on. Same thing happens with rank. We're going to define a variable called rank and then pass a pointer to that so that MPI com rank can fill in which of the processors we are. That's going to give us a value from zero to uh, one minus the number of total processors. So as you can see, MPI tends to use this notion of, of, of a pointer to a local variable or a variable that we control that it can then update um, in, in, our, in our memory space. The same thing actually happens here in MPI init. This, this looks kind of frightening, right? It's a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to a char. Um, but these two arguments here are going to seem very familiar to you if you think to the, the usual definition of a main function in C. We usually have something like int main and then we usually get int of arg c and then a char oops too many <laughs> a char star star uh, called arg v right so this is the value of the number of command line arguments that were passed in on the command line and this char star is an array of strings an array of character pointers which is why the two stars that contain the actual strings that were passed on the command line. What we're going to do when we invoke MPI init is we're actually going to do a similar thing to what we what we'll do with these other two um, uh, pointers that I've already mentioned. We're going to pass the address of argc and the address of argv to the MPI init. And again, the reason is similar, that we want to allow MPI init to make changes to our idea of argc and argv in the same way that we're passing a pointer to our size and our rank variable to allow MPI to make a change to that. What MPI is going to do for us is look for any arguments on the command line that are specific to MPI itself. And it's going to process those and use it to configure itself. And it will actually remove those arguments from the command line arguments so that once we get back from MPI init, our program can just continue forward without having to worry about any kind of configuration information for MPI. So for example, in the programs that we wrote that um, for, for the threaded programs, we had to add a command line parameter that told our program how many threads to spin up when it started to run. Um, we don't have to do that kind of stuff with MPI because MPI is going to basically tell us, hey, here's the flag I want you to pass when you want to specify, for example, the number of processors that are to be run in this invocation of this MPI program. Uh, it's going to use a very specific set of, uh, of command line arguments, and it's going to process those for us when we call MPI init, and it'll actually remove those things from the list of command line arguments. So that by the time we get to processing our own arguments, maybe the input file and output file, however we want to, however we want to use the command line arguments, those MPI specific flags have been removed. All right. So here's a very, very simple MPI program. It does very little, uh, but you can see we're just defining uh, a main function, argc and argv, like I just discussed. And then I've declared two local variables here, the number of processes and the rank of our current process. And then we're going to call MPI init. Again, we have to do that before we can do anything else with MPI. We've got to initialize things. Um, and again, we're going to pass in the address of our argc and our argv in order to allow MPI to make changes to those things to remove its configure or remove its command line specific arguments. Then it's very common that so that's required. We got to do that. It's very common after that then to figure out how many processes are running and who am I? Who is the current process? So we're going to call MPI com size and MPI com rank. Again, we're just going to pass this global communicator 
and we're, that's all we're going to probably use uh, in our programs. And then we want to pass in the address of our local variables here into which we want MPI to write the number of processes that are running and our processes rank. And then here's uh, just a simple example of some debugging output that will give us some information about who we are and where we're running. Uh, so I'm printing out the, the rank and then the number of processors associated with this invocation of the program. And then we can go do all sorts of things all at once. And when we're done doing our parallel processing, we, all, we always want to call MPI finalize at the end before we're, we exit our process. So all of the MPI related things have to happen between the calls to MPI init and MPI finalize. Uh, and that's going to be true of functions that we call from inside of main and so forth. Uh, after here, we can't do any more MPI stuff. Before here, we can't do any MPI stuff. So again, those two things have to be there, and we're almost always going to want to grab information about the configuration of our machine. Okay, now we've got our distributed memory multi-computer running. We know that we're going to have to be able to communicate back and forth between the processes that make up the, the, uh, the parallel distributed machine. So there's two very sort of central functions that we need to know how to use that allow us to communicate back and forth between the processes in our distributed memory machine. They are MPI send and MPI receive, and this is kind of the lowest level communications primitives that are defined by MPI. Um, so on the sending side, when we want to transmit something from our process to another process, we're going to call MPI send, and it's going to have, it's got a kind of a large collection of arguments. This is typical of MPI as well. The first is a void star that points to something that's named buff. Um, when we're sending information from one process to another, we need to know the location of that information, and we need to know the size of that information. So vo this void star is, again, the generic pointer, right? It used to be called char star, now it's called void star. We can pass a pointer to anything we want as that first argument to the uh, MPI send function, and that's going to tell it where to go get stuff out of memory in our process to send it someplace else. We're also going to pass a count. Now, the count in this case is not the number of bytes, but it's actually going to be the number of some primitive element in this buffer. And the specifics of that is determined by this data type parameter. So there's this MPI data type. What in the world is that? Um, here's examples of some of the MPI data types. So these are constants that are defined in an MPI header file that gets brought in when we compile our code. And what we do when we want to send information from one process to another is we say, I'm going to send, for example, uh, integers. And I want to send 10 integers. So the way I would do that would be to, back here, I'd have a buffer that is an array of integers, 10 integers presumably. I would pass 10 as the count, and I would pass MPI int as the data type, okay? So essentially what we're going to do is take the size of that data type and multiply it times the count, and that's going to give us the number of bytes that are actually going to be transferred. But we are generally not going to think in terms of individual bytes, but in those sort of larger units of integers or, um, again, back to here, floats, doubles, long doubles, right? All the basic types that we are going to encounter are defined in here so that we can, for example, have an array of integers or an array of floats or something like that. And we can send that whole array and just think about the number of integers or floats that we have instead of worrying about converting that into a number of bytes. Now this design choice that the MPI people made is reflective of the fact that this is a very easily portable cross-platform kind of a library for doing message passing. So if one machine has an integer that's four bytes and another has an integer of two and another has an integer of eight, you don't want to be worrying about that particular level of detail, particularly in the in, in the case where you have a heterogeneous distributed computer. I could have different machines with different architectures, different processors, different endianness, all sorts of different things. 
that I want to have work together on the same problem. And by abstracting out these details of just saying, hey, this is an integer, I don't have to worry about the number of bytes or the endianness or whatever on specific machines, as long as I use this facility to move information back and forth. And MPI itself will take care of uh, converting those things as necessary for the source and destination of, of communication. Now, of course, we still can send an individual number of bytes, right? You'll notice here that we have MPI byte, uh, MPI, well, MPI char, sign char, but MPI byte, for example, if we just want to send raw binary stuff from one machine to another, one process to another, we can do that by using MPI byte. But in general, we're going to try to use one of these other types that's specific to the underlying data type um, when we're doing these communications operations. Okay, so we've got the, the pointer to the beginning of the data, the number of elements, the type of each element, and then we want to say where do we want to send this thing. So the dest here is the rank of the process to which we want to transmit this buffer. We can also send uh, what's, what MPI calls a tag. This is just a generic integer value that we can use for our own purposes as we see fit to distinguish one type of a message from another. So in addition to just having this general purpose facility for transmitting information to another, another process, we can also send along a little hint to say, hey, this is a message of type X. With a we can put a tag of one or two or four or whatever we want. And that tag could be used to specify different types of information that we're transmitting from one process to another process. We'll see how that works as we go. And then finally, uh, there's a communicator that needs to be passed as the last argument to MPI send. And again, we're just going to use MPI com world to bring all of the processes in the distributed computer into the picture. Okay, so that's how we send information to another process. When we're using MPI, we have to have both ends of the communication cooperate with one another. So just doing an MPI send on one process doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be receiving the information on the destination process. In fact, we have to call on the destination process the corresponding function MPI receive in order to pull that data into the, into this, into the destination process. This is a similar kind of an interface. We're first of all going to specify a buffer, whereas in the MPI send, the buff parameter says, here's the beginning of the data I want you to transmit. On the receive side, the buff is going to point to memory that says, here's where I want you to store the information that was received from another process. And then the count and the data type are the same. They basically tell MPI receive, here's how many elements I have at that buff location and what the fundamental data type is that I'm expecting to receive. I also specify the source, the rank of the process that's, that I want to receive from, and I can select which kind of message I want to receive by giving it a tag. So if one process is sending messages to another process using different tags at different times, the, uh, the two sides can uh, selectively choose to receive the information as it comes in. We've got a communicator again um, that's going to be MPI COM world. And then the final value here is a status structure that will give us some information about the success or failure of this communication from another, another process. Notice that there's a pointer here, and this follows again the MPI convention that when we want MPI to give us something back from based on what it's done. We give it a pointer to a, to a structure or a value that we define so that it can fill in those values and then we can be appraised of, of the values that were stored there. Okay, so again, these two things have to be paired up in order for us to move information from one machine to another. Okay, there's the types that we've already discussed, and here's that status uh, uh, structure. So that's the, the uh, MPI status here that's on the receive side of these primitive communications operations. It's a structure called MPI status, and it has the source, which is where the, it's the rank of the process that the information came from. It's got the tag, which was the tag value sent by the sender. And then it's got an error value that will give us any indication that something might have gone haywire. So when we call MPI receive, 
we need to have defined a structure or a variable with an MPI status type, and then we're going to pass the address of that into MPI receive, and it's going to fill in those values in our local variable that contains that status information. For our first example here, I'm just going to do a really simple program that communicates back and forth among multiple processes. So we're going to just have basically four processes, and they're going to get numbered 0 through 3. That would be the, the rank of the process. And what we're going to do is connect these up in a circle. And what we're going to do then at each of these nodes is we're going to generate a random value and we're going to communicate it to the next process in the circle. And we're also going to receive a random value from the previous process in the circle and kind of round robin things in that fashion. So that's the basic idea of this example program. Here's the code for this round robin program. Uh, similar to the previous example we looked at, we're defining our numprocs and our rank and calling MPI init with our argc and argv, and then um, grabbing our communicator size and rank in those two variables. So numprox is going to be the number of processors, rank is going to be our particular rank. Then um, I'm going to do some debugging output here. I'm very fond of doing that. I recommend it to you. Uh, so print this statement. I always include as the first uh, output value the rank of the processor that's sending output. So this is exactly what we saw before where we're printing our rank and the number of processors, processors that are processes that are active. And then we're going to call this round robin function. And that's going to do all the interesting stuff. And then when we're done, we'll print again our rank and say goodbye. And then we'll finalize. So round robin is the function of interest. Now, one thing to keep in mind here that's different from what we experienced when we were doing threads programming is that we're not asking a separate library to start another function for us after it spins up a new thread. Each of the MPI processes is exactly that. It's a process running on its own uh, on its own processor, and we're just making an ordinary function call here into another C function called round robin. No, um, no startup function, no parameters, none of that kind of stuff. We're just going to invoke this function directly inside of this process. Okay, so let's take a look at what this round robin function does. First of all, I'm going to keep track of some random values. And again, we're just generating random values here so that we can kind of see the behavior as we move things around through that circular configuration of the multi-computer. So I'm going to keep track of the random value that I have. And when I speak anthropomorphically like that, I'm referring to a specific process, right? So we'll just imagine that we're a process. Uh, so I have a particular random value, and there's also a random value that I'm going to receive from the previous processor in that ring into which we're mapping these processors. Um, so I want to just hang on or have, have some space declared to store those values. Now, we're basically imposing on this distributed multi-computer a ring structure, as I illustrated previously. So it's convenient to be able to have a, uh, a variable that refers to the my, my neighbors in that ring. So the next rank is going to be my rank plus 1, modulo the number of processors. Notice that the parameters being passed in here are my rank and the number of processors, and those came from here. I'm passing in rank and num prox. I changed the name of that for some reason. Um, so if I'm processor zero, my rank is going to be zero. If there's four processes that are running in total in this invocation of this parallel program, that's going to be four. So those are the values that I'm going to have passed in um, the rank and the number of processors. So if my rank is zero, well, then the next rank in the in the um, in the ring is going to be my rank plus one or one. Uh, that works fine until I get to the largest numbered rank. In this case, it's going to be three, and in that case, I'm going to calculate three plus one, which is going to give me four. But that's not a valid rank number when I have zero to three. So I'm going to divide that, or I'm sorry, I'm going to modulus that by the number of processors. So if I'm on process zero, one, or two that works fine. I'm just going to get the next one in series. But if I'm on the, the highest numbered processor, processor 3, I'm going to add 1 to that, and then I'm going to modulus that by the number of processors, which is 4. So my next neighbor will be process 0. 
Similarly, I want to know where I'm going to be getting random values from. So the rank previous is a little bit more elaborate to calculate, I guess. If I'm rank zero, then I'm going to make, or I'm going to have as my previous neighbor, the number of processes minus one, right? So just like rank three's next rank is process zero, rank zero's process or previous rank is going to be process three. Otherwise, I'm just going to take and subtract one from my rank, and that will give me the previous one in the ring. So again, if we've got a ring that's got zero, one, two, and three, we're basically kind of calculating how we're going to move things around the around the ring in that direction. So for processor zero here, my next is process one, my previous is process three, and so forth. Okay, so that gives me a pretty clear picture of who I'm going to send and receive from. I'm going to define an MPI status uh, structure here so I can keep track of status information on the MPI receive function calls. And then I'm going to generate a random number. So I'm going to seed the random, uh, the random number generator with the, uh, the current time um, plus my rank just to make it more random -er. <laughs> Um, and then I'm going to calculate my random value. So I'm going to just take random and I'm going to divide it by rand max divided by 100. That's just to kind of get this into a reasonable a reasonable value here. Um, uh, doesn't really make any difference what that specific value is. And then we're going to reveal to the to the world what that random value is. So again, here's my rank. I'm printing that out in every printf message. And then my random value is this value. So rand mine. So that's going to show up in the output. We'll see for each processor what random value they are using, and then we'll watch those random values rotate around this round robin mapping. Okay, now this is, sorry, this is such a busy slide. As I mentioned, these function calls in MPI tend to be kind of verbose, but we've got basically two things going on here. Um, the, an if portion and an else portion. And you'll see here at the top, we've got a, we've got a, conditional that says if my rank modulo 2 is 0, we're going to do one thing. And if it's not, we're going to do a different thing. Now the idea here is that, remember that we have both a send and a receive primitive in MPI. What we want to do in this particular case is organize the calling of those send and receive functions in such a way that when one process is sending to another, that that other process is listening to the first. So we're essentially dividing the processes into two groups, ones that are going to send first and then receive, and ones that are going to receive first and then send. So in the in the first case, uh, if the rank is in fact evenly divisible by two, well, we're going to do some debugging output, right? Say, I am sending my random value to some other processor, okay? So my rank, my random value, and the next processor that I calculated back here, rank next. And then I'm going to do an MPI send. Now, what I want to send is this long integer that contains the random value. That's what's coming back from the random function and so forth, which is why this is defined to be a long. So um, I'm going to do an MPI send. The first argument is the address where that buffer lives. In this case, I'm just sending a single long integer. So I'm just going to take the address of that random value that's mine. I'm going to send just one of those things. It's kind of rare that we'll only send one value back and forth, but in this case, that's all we need. And the thing that I'm sending is a long. So the type that I tell MPI to send will be implemented appropriately on the local architecture to send that many bytes to um, to the next processor. The destination rank is called rank next. That's the one I've calculated previously. This one is the tag, and I'm just using that value here consistently because there's no real reason to distinguish one type of message from another. They're all going to contain random values going around the ring. And then my communicator, again, is just going to be MPI com world. Okay, so while the process while each of the processors that have an even rank number are doing this send, on the other side of this if statement, we're going to do a receive from the processor that's currently sending. So here's another uh, deep piece of debugging output. Rank whatever is receiving from process rank prev. 
Again, the value that I calculated here for the rank of the previous processor in that ring that we're imposing over the CPUs. And then here's my MPI receive function. Again, we're going to pass in a pointer to the memory that's going to, that's going to be used to store the value that I receive. And I'm using the address of randpreve, which again, I defined up here as a long. So that's where the value is going to get stored. And we're going to get one thing, and the thing is the size of an MPI long. So these correspond in the, on, the, on the sending and the receiving side. We're sending one MPI long. We have to say where are we getting this value from, because we could have a whole bunch of different processors that are all suddenly sending us information. We want to pick out the one that's, that's of interest. So we say, I want to get this from my, pre my rank previous, the one behind me. Uh, the tag of one, again, we'll just use because we need a value there, but it doesn't really matter what it is as long as it's consistent. We're still using the world communicator, and here's where we use that status value. So, again, in the following the MPI convention, we're going to take and give the address of a structure that's going to be able to contain the information that MPI passes along. So, at the very beginning of the execution of this program, after everything gets gets initialized and we extract all our ranks and that kind of stuff, the very first thing every process is going to do is figure out, am I sending first or am I receiving first? And then it goes ahead and does that. So by the time we get to here on the even-numbered processors and to here on the odd-numbered ones, we're going to have a situation where we've sent the, the random number from this processor and received it on this processor. Now we're going to do the opposite. We're going to go ahead and receive on the even-numbered processors and send from the odd-numbered ones. So and it, this is exactly analogous code. We're going to give a little output to give a debugging information, and then we're going to run MPI receive, and this is essentially exactly the same code, right? Ran, we're going to get into the random previous buffer, one MPI long, get it from the previous rank, tag is just a dummy value from the world communicator, and we're going to have a status value filled in there as well. And then on the corresponding side, um, or the corresponding communication on the, on the previous processor is going to be to send its value to the next rank, um, and it's going to consist of one long value. Okay, so again, going back to this picture, we're basically saying in the first, kind of the first phase of communication, that the even-numbered processors, let's just look at the communication with processor two, the even-numbered processors are going to send, and the odd ones are going to receive that transmission. And then the odd number processors are going to send, and the even ones are going to receive that transmission. And at that point, we've now kind of gone one step around the ring, passing along our random value to the next processor in the ring. Okay, finally, we can do some output to verify that we got what we think we got. So here's our, our rank. And then uh, this actually is two greater than signs that got m monkeyed with because of the way tech processed this slide. But it says, I had this value. That was my, my local value. And then it's going to say, I got from my previous rank, from the previous rank, this value that it sent to me. So we can kind of tell who's doing the sending, who's doing the receiving, and that the values matched up properly as the algorithm executed. Okay, so here's here's the output from one run of this, and it's non-deterministic, right? So um, we might see it in a completely different sequence, and I'm generating random numbers, so the values themselves might be different. But let's just try to decode what's going on here. Let's, let's look at um, process, well, we'll just start here at the beginning. Uh, we've got process rank one. It says hello and confirms that there's four processes running. And then the next thing it does is tells us its random number. So process one is going to be sending the value 29 around the ring. And let's kind of skip down here to, uh, to the next place where we see process one. It says it's sending that value 29 to process two. So we can verify that process one is in fact sending it to the proper next process in the ring. And then it's going to turn around and receive from its previous process, which we know is going to be process zero. So the next thing we see from process one is it's saying, 
I had a 29, and 0 had a 93. Now, it only knows this because 0 had previously sent the value that it had generated to 1. So let's go find out where 0 is doing. So here's where 0's output shows up. It's saying hello, confirming that there's four processes, and it says it generated a random number of 93. And then it sent the 93 to process 1, which is how this output verify, or that, that's where we get that value from, then we can verify that that communication took place properly. Um, this is a, so you, know, you could follow through the rest of these things to note that the communication took place properly around the ring and that everybody got the right value from the previous process. Um, this is a little hard to decode. Uh, for four processes, it's not too bad. But if we have more processes than that, or we have a bunch of more steps to, uh, to try to figure out what's going on, um, just a quick trick here is that you can take, if this, this is just logging out, which you could send to a file, you can sort that file as follows. Uh, so if we take, um, the, I've, I've stored that output in a file called output.txt, and this is the actual sequence of output lines that were in that file originally. Just whatever order the processes decided to output stuff non-deterministically is what gets stored in that file. But I can sort that in a way that makes this a whole lot easier to read. So first of all, um, well, so we're going to run the standard Unix sort function, and we're going to do a numeric sort because we want to sort against the first part of each line in that file and treat it as a numeric value. So if we, um, so we're going to get it in numeric order. We also want to pass uh, this flag to the sort function that says stable. So what a stable sort does, as you may know from 243 or from 265 or elsewhere, a stable sort maintains the relative order of the lines in the input. So we don't want, for example, we've got output from processor one here, and we've got more output from processor one here. We don't want the sort operation to to change the relative order of these lines in any way. I want to when when I look in the in the input and see these one, two, three, four, five lines from process one, I want to have those lines in the same order in the output of the sort. If I don't say dash dash stable, it's possible that the sort algorithm would just permute these lines in whatever convenient order uh, it, it chooses as part of the sorting process. That's actually going to be generally faster um, which is why you've got to give a specific flag to the sort program to tell it, hey, I want you to keep the lines in the same relative order. So that's a stable sort. And you can see here that the output of this is all of the lines from processor 0, then all the lines from process 1, process 2, and process 3. And they've been retained in that initial sequence. So we can see if process 0 is sending a, or its local variable local random value is 93, it sends it to 1, uh, process 1's random value is 29, it sends it to 2, and it got a 93 from process 0. And you can follow that through here. So this is a nice way to look at that output one process at a time instead of trying to do dope out what's going on from this kind of random non-deterministic output.